Guns for General Washington. Chapter 22. Partings. The trip from Westfield to Springfield was a short one, but the trail was deep in mud, so the pace of the convoy was slow. As they neared Springfield, the happy mood of the travelers changed to one of gloom. The reason was clear to William. Many of the drivers had agreed to stay with the train as far as Springfield. At that point, with the guns safely across the mountains, they were ready to return to their farms and towns in New York State. The men missed their families and were needed at home, but they had developed ties of loyalty to the mission and found it hard to tear themselves away. Among those due to leave were the Beckers, who faced a long trip back to Glen Falls. They'd been part of this venture day and night for over a month, and for J.P. it was painful to leave. When he said goodbye to William, he had to swallow hard to keep his voice steady. Will also felt sad, but he grinned, reached out, and ruffled J.P.'s hair. Don't you mind, old friend, he said. We'll meet up again, I promise. We'll have a proper visit after we send the Redcoats packing. At last, Mr. Becker clucked to the horses, and the empty wagon started off. J.P. turned around and watched the group standing near the vehicles. He kept watching longingly until a bend in the trail hid the convoy from view. Next morning, with new drivers and fresh oxen, the caravan pushed on through the thick mud. It was a long run to the next stop, the town of Worcester, but they made it at last and rested overnight. Then at daybreak, like so many other daybreaks, Henry roused the men and led his convoy on to Farmingham. There they were now a mere 20 miles from Cambridge, and it suddenly dawned on Will that the journey was almost over. They really had done the impossible. The young man was elated, but Henry refused to relax. We're not finished, he said. I'll only rest easy when every gun is in place. John Adams, a member of the Colonial Congress, later to become second president of the United States, was staying near Farmingham. With his friend, Elbridge Jerry, he hurried to town to inspect the new weapons. He was thrilled with what he saw and that night wrote about it in his diary. The next day, leaving Will in charge, Henry mounted a fast horse and raced to Cambridge to report. Washington and the others greeted him joyfully, and some of the officers apologized for having once doubted the foolhardy plan. They showered him with praise and compliments, all of which he shrugged off. Sirs, he said with a smile, if anyone deserves credit, it's the drivers, the troopers, and those hardworking animals. Later at council meeting, The mood grew serious. At last, they had good artillery, and a big shipment of powder was on its way. But General Howe had also gained in strength. He commanded a huge army of redcoats, and his warships could still destroy Boston. The colonists would have to move very carefully. According to their spies, the British had no idea that the rebels had located heavy cannon. How could they guard this vital secret and keep the enemy in the dark? Now they had real power. What was the best way to use it? And we'll read chapter 23 next time. Till then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thanks for listening. Love you guys. Bye-bye.